And so much space. Good morning. It's always nice to have an audience warmed up. In this case, perhaps a bit too literally. Um, as uh, Harpy said, I'm responsible for Extension's DevOps practice. Um, in this role, I kind of have to present a number of faces. So for those of you from the uh, Jenkins Summit, um, my background's a Unix admin. Um, I spent the first years, five years of my career um, supporting servers. I've used the soldering iron twice in the service of Accenture. Um, for those of you from the Continuous Delivery Summit, um, I'm responsible for our DevOps practice, nearly 1,000 people, services that we deliver to a number of our clients and engagements. Um, Mark's going to be joining me on stage in a little bit, so we'll be seeing Mark in a bit later. DevOps, the movement for me, started in 2009 when Flickr stood on stage at Velocity Conference and proudly announced they were doing 10 deployments per day. Etsy, last year, over 50 deployments per day to their live environment. Amazon, deploy code to production. They're on record as saying they deploy every 11.6 seconds. These are phenomenal numbers. And for me, the most interesting question is why? Why are these guys delivering code at that sort of frequency? So I'm going to spend a little bit of time exploring that. If we consider a software development lifecycle, we start with some requirements, we build them, we QA them, and then hopefully we get the value by operating them. The challenge is, at the time those requirements are specified, the people specifying them don't really know how the users can use the system. They don't know what the perfect design of a website is to get the maximum revenue or profit. They don't know what that perfect um, conversation in a call center to get the minimum dropout rate is, whatever business metrics. In effect, they're guessing. An educated guess, certainly, but a guess. Um, and the only way they can validate that guess and know that what they're delivering is um, the optimal solution is by getting feedback. Not feedback based on one or two users, but feedback from the way in which the customers and the users actually use that system. And the only way they'll get a lot of feedback is by running experiments and repeatedly testing and trying new things and seeing from real customer behavior what actually happens and does a four by four grid get the maximum sales on a site? Should it be three by three? Should it be continuously scrolling? Only by testing these things on a portion of their customers are they going to know. And I think the thing that would define success for a lot of businesses is how quickly they're able to do that. How, how able they are to tune their application to meet whatever their business is trying to achieve. And the difference from running an experiment once a, once a year to being able to run, as Etsy do, 50 deploys in a day is phenomenal. Microsoft have, have stated that they believe 30% of, of changes don't deliver the business value or the business metrics they were trying to influence. Netflix, who I can only assume have a much better ability to experiment, have said only 10%. So, in the words of Michelangelo, um, probably undervalued for his work on DevOps, I think when we look at continuous delivery and what we're trying to do, our danger is we set the bar way too low. I, I have conversations with projects or clients where they're talking about, we'd like to go from waterfall down to sprints. We'd like to deploy once a month. And to be a little bit provocative, I ask, why once a month? Why not once every two weeks? Why not 10 times a day? Um, and my fear is that we end up viewing um, DevOps or continuous delivery as just the compression of waterfall. And it's not. It needs to be more transformational than that. So what do I think we should aim for? I kind of gave the clue away in the title. I think we need to be aiming to be able to support deployment to production 50 times a day. That's not to say I think we should be deploying 50 times a day, not in all cases. I think it's critical that by aiming for this, we get rock solid configuration management. You wouldn't dream of going for this target without absolute control of your code. 
you wouldn't dream of going for this target if you didn't know your testing was a good test of whether the application was fit to go live. You wouldn't dream of going for this if you couldn't deploy without impacting the production service. So it may be 50 deploys per day is not what every business needs. In fact, almost certainly it's not what every business needs. Um, although I think we'll find over time that boundary gets tested more. Um, what I do think is the amount of good engineering discipline that we bring with us by aiming for that carries such value that it's a, a reasonable target to be aiming for. So in the words of Bruce Lee, who is also not very well known for his DevOps work, um, but does have some fantastic quotes on live, I think it's a goal to be aimed for, not in this case something we try and achieve in every instance. And the reason we're doing that is because we get to improve continuously. We get to target the things that matter to us and the metrics that matter to us and evolve them, not just in terms of the behavior of the live application, but also in the way in which we deliver. Each time we go through that sprint, each time we go through that cycle, that's another opportunity to improve the performance of our development process, to improve the level of automation, to improve the operational characteristics of a system. And that's really powerful. So let's talk a little bit about how we might do it. And unsurprisingly, ah, unsurprisingly, I'm going to define DevOps. Um, there are about 500 people in this room. That means we have approximately 500 definitions of DevOps in this room. So I'm going to give you mine. For me, for me, the primary thing we're aiming for in DevOps is continuous delivery, to be able to support the stable deployment of code and enable that experimentation. To me, the continuous delivery aspect is the most important thing. And within that, we end up in conversation with pipelines, continuous delivery tools such as Jenkins, um, test automation, lean. Um, but in order to support that, I find we end up getting drawn into a lot of conversations about architecture, the runtime architecture. Where is the state stored in the application? How granular can we make those components to support that delivery as we drive down towards microservices? Are we able to make our servers immutable to support the, that easy deploy and higher availability? So we end up getting drawn into a lot of architectural questions. And then the third dimension for me, we for a long while have been able to run content management systems, make changes to the look, feel, the text in live. With, with continuous delivery, we're pushing that down the, pipe, down the stack. We're now deploying the application in that way. And as we start looking at things like software-defined platforms, cloud, Chef, um, Terraform, these languages are giving us the capability to push that all the way down to the infrastructure layer. And what definition of DevOps would be complete without talking about culture? In order to deliver that, we need development and operations to be working together. Systems theory would tell us if we optimize dev for rapid change and ops for stability, we de-optimize the whole. And for me, that culture of sharing, collaboration, earlier engagement of ops is necessary to achieve what the prime directive is of that the flex business flexibility against a stable platform. So that's my definition. So I'm going to touch a few points as we go through, um, starting with continuous delivery. What we're looking at here is the concept of going from somebody having an idea to that idea adding value to the business. And between that, there's a set of steps we have to go through, the value stream. It's all very lean in concept. And what we traditionally do is group those ideas together into a release. The problem we have, I don't know why I point. It doesn't do anything on a point. Um, the problem we have is that those releases take longer time. They're bigger. They take longer. And are a bit more scary when we put them live. And our natural tendency has historically been bigger releases. That will solve it. A characteristic of that is we're not getting any value from that in the business until the release goes live. And going back to what I said about those requirements being a guess, we're only getting that value if we guessed well. If we guessed badly, we're not even getting that. So taking 
agile principles, we instead a series of incremental changes. The first thing we're getting is, increment, is value much earlier. And that's, that, in business case terms, has value already. It's also giving us the ability to start tuning our direction and our approach based on the feedback we're getting from the business, from the customers. You know, is that change really making a difference to, that we expected to our revenue, to our sales, to our basket dropout rate, whatever the metric that matters for the business you're in? And it's giving us that ability to optimize the process. In this particular example, three times to try something new, three opportunities to try something new in the way in which we're delivering software. Three opportunities to do something a little bit better. And taking that journey as we go from value to, um, from idea to value, continuously we map it out into a pipeline. We go from checked in code to some static code analysis to, um, to system testing to performance testing to whatever the steps in that journey that are appropriate for the level of risk your business is, is looking for. And typically, this would look very much like a waterfall approach. We're going from some very, very quick tests through to some very comprehensive tests. We're starting with the deep, deep testing we'd do of a unit, followed by the broader sweeping tests we'd do of a component. And in terms of the pipeline, I tend to think of it as a series of steps. What do we want the developers to do before they've checked in the code? What do we want them to do after checking in the code before they go and get a coffee? What do we want them to wait for before they can go home? And what's it OK for them to pick up the next day? And thinking of the pipeline in terms of those phases of the life cycle is helpful in shaping the way in which we design that pipeline. So in the words of Deming, I, I think it's a, almost a law that if you're going to stand on stage and talk about DevOps, you have to quote Deming. By building that quality into the process and getting that feedback to the developer earlier, we're building quality right in. We get a few things happening here. Firstly, by getting feedback to the developer faster, they have more context on the change they've made. If you consider a world, uh, a large project where 30 people have developed code for three months, and then six months later, somebody goes, Into, it's slow. That's a lot of triage to do. By contrast, if you can tell a developer within 24 hours, that their code change has made interface 27 slow. They know what they were doing. They know why they were doing it. Might even have the test cases still on their laptop. They'll have a lot more context, and there's a productivity gain that comes from doing that. And in describing continuous delivery, what we're really saying is each check-in being made is a candidate production release. We want to QA to the extent we would for a production release every time the developer changed the code. The analogy I like to use is comes from manufacturing. As we move from just-in-time, from large batch manufacturing, how do we effectively produce 100 car bonnets to how do we produce the right car bonnet and change the dye within a minute is really analogous to me to the change we're going through as an industry. Secondly, if you're looking for that optimization, You've got to be confident that what you're doing in your dev environments is meaningful in life. Your environments have to be representative. You've got to be using the same process and deployment tools in all environments, including life. And lastly, coming back to manufacturing, and it would take Toyota's and Uncord, if you fail unit test, what's the point wasting all the resource running system test? You know it's not fit for purpose. You found that out. You don't need to waste the resource. So, so stopping the production line and sending it back to source on a failure is another concept I think we're currently stealing from manufacturing. Talking to anti-fragile design, we are going to have failures. Historically, I think we've worked on reducing the probability of those failures. How do you manage that change? How do you control it? How do you be, be sure that you've considered every possible impact? And obviously, reducing the probability of failure is good. The way I think of anti-fragile design is we're focusing more on the impact of those failures. How do we make the site degrade gracefully? If we take Netflix example, if their recommendation engine doesn't work, 
I'm sure you just get default recommendations. Okay. The site remains functional. And tr working to minimize the, both the impact and also the speed at which you can recover from a failure is key. Um, Etsy, uh, to be clear, a project we're not even slightly involved in. Um, one of the beauties of the DevOps space is people are really free with their information. Uh, and Etsy have presentations online where they'll talk about how they've increased changes from one a year to 250 a day, but reduced the probability of failure, massively reduced the time to recover the failure, massively re reduced the impact of the failure, net availability higher. Fascinating. So if we assume failure is unavoidable, and we're looking for that graceful degradation, also focusing on the time to recover. So when these companies are talking about throwing in hundreds of changes a day, now that's not a big bang release. They're small micro changes, most probably all hid behind a feature toggle so they can back them out in seconds, all being exercised on a really small portion of their customer base. So they're A-B testing it. And we need to be able to measure the impact or cost of those failures. This is the metric we need to be optimizing for. I'm not going to talk much about this, because in a second I'm going to have Mark up to show you, show you this. In fact, Mark, do you want to join, join me and get ready? Um, but I am going to talk a little bit about pets and cattle, a metaphor I'm sure a number of you are familiar with. And this metaphor lets us um, either present, either consider our, our infrastructure and our servers to be like a pet, if you've got a pet as a server, you've probably called it something like fluffy.accenture.com. MyWebserver.accenture.com. Um, you probably love it. You probably care for it. If it's ill, you send your sysadmins and DBAs in to cuddle it and make it better. By contrast, farmers don't think like that. Well, I believe that. I've never been a farmer. My, my, my assertion is farmers don't think like that. One cow is pretty much like another cow, certainly to me. If a cow's ill, well, you might send it to a vet. You might just shoot it and replace it. Um, and if we use, apply that metal for servers, the ability to treat our servers as disposable assets, to phoenix them on demand, means that we don't have to ex exercise the um, veterinary costs. We don't have to watch that, that, that server age over time. And by taking, language, taking concepts such as infrastructure as code, we're able to take the concepts of DevOps all the way down the platform. And I'm going to touch really briefly. I've put a great big obstacle in the middle of the stage. Um, for, for, me, for, for me, when we talk about DevOps as a cultural aspect, I think the really key thing is aligning to business outcomes. That often gets called no silos. I guess I'm personally not so worried about a team's organization. We find big, big enterprises invariably have teams. That's the only way you can manage that volume of people. What matters is all of those organizations are aligned to the same goal. They're all working to the same metrics. They're all working to the same principles. They're all trying to achieve the same thing. We discussed how we'd moved the responsibility for code quality to that developer building quality into the process, making it everyone's responsibility. It is not, in my view, the test team's job to find defects caused by poor coding practice. We're better off fixing the coding practice. We spoke about continuous learning, and, and the key thing for me on culture is that definition of done. If code is only done when it's been developed, it's fit for functional purpose. We can operate it. We're ready to deploy it to production. If we get that definition of done right, quite a lot follows. So, I've invited Mark on stage. I'm going to make it real. Um, in the next few minutes, I'm going to create a, I'm, Mark is going to create an application. Um, make that application available. Use it to gather a little bit of feedback about this session. Make a change to that application and watch it go through a continuous delivery pipeline, all whilst on stage. When people talk about praying to the gods of demos, trust me, I'm praying. What could go wrong? What could go wrong? So, using Amazon Cloud Formation, it's a Amazon specific language for describing SACs. Mark's going to navigate through using a JSON file, which you won't be surprised to know was created earlier. 
Um, and that file is going to specify an environment for us. So I'm going to get Mark to kick off the CloudFormation, we'll get it building. I'll describe to you what it's doing, and then um, we'll come back and see what it's done. Ooh. If we could go back to Mark for a second, please. This is my moment. This is your moment, yeah. This moment is going to define your career one way or the other. <laughs> You'll be fine. <laughs> so, eight, eight virtual machines running at a cost of you know, somewhere in the $250 a month mark. That's what it says, 281. 281, that's inflation for you. So, if you could kick it off. Sure. So what's happening now is we just fired into the Amazon API. That is causing us to build a suite of things. And you can see the, the, from the status we're now in the process of creating. Can you just fire up a, the CloudFormation so I can sure. show what that looks like? I, I find it helps. So this, this is nearly, well, this is one of the more challenging languages to write in because it's JSON. I mean, in fact, we tend to, we tend to generate these. OK, so this, this is the structure of what we're working through. You can see we're using some machine images. Those have Docker on them. If, um, Mark, you could just show an EC2 instance. The file's defining in notational programmatic form the infrastructure I want to create. This is really powerful, because this and other languages like this are letting me version control all the way down to the structure of my data center and start treating that for continuous delivery. So if you remember my third axis, this is how we achieve building a data center in a repeatable, consistent way, this and tools like it. If I could pop back to the slides for me. Thank you. So what we're building here is a tool stack. We're building a application server running on Node and a suite of tools all configured to work together. Um, with, of course, a continuous delivery pipeline, unsurprisingly, given the conference I'm at, using Jenkins. What's happening through the cloud formation is in a single Amazon, re in a, in a Amazon region, Ireland, in currently working just one availability zone. I wouldn't recommend that as good practice for production. We've built a virtual private data center, you know, a virtual private cloud. That's, in effect, our data center. Three subnets, created ourselves a route to the internet, created routing between those subnets, applied security groups in order that only the front-facing servers, our proxy server, can be exposed to the internet. Using the AMI that we saw in that config file, we're creating those eight VMs, and then pulling down from a Docker, ser a Docker registry server, a suite of containers. And those containers are then deploying the tools that we saw in the first picture. This means we're going from nothing to a working continuous delivery environment and an app, well, I say working, <laughs> to, from nothing to a continuous delivery environment during the course of this presentation. So how are we doing, Mark? We're getting there. So uh, we finished standing up the stack, but obviously some of the apps may still be coming up. The, uh, you saw me paste an IP address in. We've got a domain name mapped to that, so it's a question of uh, hitting the domain name and uh, you know biting on nails, basically. So that app should be publicly available at this IP address. If you've got a phone, please visit it. Give me some feedback. If it's positive feedback, I'm going to assume it's about me. And if it's developmental feedback, <laughs> it should be there now. Do you want to put my uh, screen back on the? So that's ata-eu.accenture.com. So you need to put in a name so we can see who's doing the feedback. Cool, thanks, Andrew. It's fed back already, I'm going to vote. So, so we're, we're up and running. We have an application. How are we doing? 4.3 and entered. I'm more relevant than I'm entertaining. I think that about sums me up. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, so there is something I'd like to do to this app. It's all about social media, right? Let's add a Twitter button. So, off, off, off that application, I'm going to ask Mark to make a change. This is why I have Mark on stage. Um, so, the change I'm going to ask Mark to make is to take that application and add um, a Twitter button to it. So, let's give it a go. Mark. So this is obviously a reference application that we use mainly for this purpose, actually, but is also quite helpful in educating our own team in what good can look like. So taking a code snippet that might have been developed earlier by somebody a bit better than no, uh, JavaScript than me. You can, you can talk. I'm coding here. I know. I'm fascinated. <laughs> <laughs> so. By injecting that code line, we've introduced the code change. That was a very fast type typing mark. Well done. Um, we're going to commit that and push it to the Git repository. And what we're trying to give you a feel for is what the, what the process could feel like for a developer working in an organization doing continuous delivery. Um, and going back to my original point, 50 today's prod is essential. I believe DevOps and this has concept whatever methodology you're doing. Even if what you're doing is um, waterfall, there is still huge value to um, a test lead and being able to get fixes through at this rate. And there's huge value to a test lead in terms of envir environment availability and productivity coming from those changes coming with automated QA. So Mark's made the change. We pushed it to the Git repository, which means the place we need to go is Jenkins. For one time, I'm not really too worried about whether Jenkins works or not with the uh, creator <laughs> here. <laughs> So that change go. has been picked up, and we're running. You can see here that we're using Jenkins with a variety of plugins, including the continuous delivery plug, including the build pipeline. So that's kicked off, and what we're going through is now a number of steps, starting with compilation. So we're building that code. This is going to take about a minute. That's going to test my um, ability to keep you entertained for a minute. Um, and that's working directly from a baseline in the Git repository. So we've picked up via Garrett, um, promoted that code, and are doing the um, build. Following that build, when we come back to that value stream, we're going to go through a series of checks. So there you go. Still on the build. So once that build's complete, we're going to go through a series of, of checks, which are the quality gates that I've deemed it's necessary for the quality of my application to appear as a you know, business user. In, in this case, adequate quality to exhibit to stage. We can probably have a look at an earlier quality no, report if you want. We're done. OK. So next step is static code analysis. Um, and that will be going through, in, in this case, we're using uh, Pluto, um, a JavaScript source code analyzer. And you can see we're starting to pick up things like the maintainability, the lines of code, um, and the coding practice that the team developing this reference application have used. All right, so static code analysis is done. We're now, we're now deploying the application to our CI test environment. Um, and each one of these rows, each one of these rows, represents a check-in. So as we're working our way through the process. So we've deployed to the CI environment, and now we're running some functional test automation. So Mark, if you could bring up the functional test log. Mm-hmm. Not too much so, to see here, just uh, so 112 tests that we ran. Obviously, you may have noticed I didn't write a new test for my change. <laughs> now, I should be fired for that. So we passed the tests. Um, obviously, here this is a set of tests optimized for speed. Um, we've also run some technical tests on that code. So using Gatling, we fired a series of technical tests into that to assess the performance. So if you can bring Gatling up, Mark. Yeah, we can have a look at Gatling. We can also have a look at OWASP, if you like. So starting with Gatling. 
the sweet performance tests executed. It passed, so I assume it's fast enough. Um, and while we've been executing the functional tests, we've also put it through OWASP, so we're starting to do some security validation of that code too. So we made it to a prod deployment. Just questions when my change worked. So, hey. so what we're doing now is A, B testing the application. <laughs> um, so we're currently A, B testing the application, if, and if anyone's comment anyone is submitting feedback, oh, no. you'll, on 50 <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> on 50 percent of the hits, you'll be seeing that Twitter feed, and on 50 percent you won't. Now that's obviously quite a simplistic A, B test. If I was at you know retail bank, a retail online scale, I might be doing it with less than a percentage, you know, a fraction of a percentage to start seeing. And at this point, what I'd be looking for is the business metrics. You guys will now be telling me whether my presentation is more relevant and more entertaining with the Twitter button or without. In this case, I don't really care what you think. We're going to push it anyway. <laughs> so if I get Mark to make the final change, having ascertained against the somewhat arrogant criteria I've just exhibited that the change is fit to go, we're going to push it to live. Just to uh, sort of hammer home, I just did a few refreshes, and 50% of the time we're not getting the tweet button, and uh, it's like flipping a coin. <laughs> We've got the tweet button. Now if I push to both prods, uh, or both instances, we should see the tweet button consistently. Okay. Not evil enough. Brilliant. Okay, so the final thing that we can do with this sort of infrastructure is tear down incredibly quickly. So, so Mark, $280 a month is quite a lot. Let's stop paying it. We're done. Okay, we're done. And having deleted that stack, I can also delete Mark. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> So ha having shown you, hopefully, the art of the possible, I, just, I was asked to touch on a, how, you, how you might start adopting it. Um, and for me, there's a bit of a pyramid or a hierarchy of needs, going from if you don't have good configuration management, if you don't have good control of your code, you're probably not ready for continuous delivery. And you need to start by having good control, and then you need to work up through having a clear view of how your environments are defined, being able to deploy that code repeatedly, being able to automate that deployment, to me, is a hierarchy that's working up through, the pinnacle of which, which frankly might not be a summit everyone's trying to reach, is continuous delivery. But even on large waterfall projects, I think a lot of these concepts have value, even if all we're doing is improving the productivity of the test cycle. Um, I stole this metaphor shamelessly from Kurt, who presented the keynote yesterday. So much so, I've included his Twitter handle on, on the slide. Kurt described how DevOps seems to grow in big organizations as um, the way in which crystals evolve, with small pockets of excellence slowly spreading out as others get accustomed to it. To me, to me zombie apocalypse would be another good metaphor. Um, and really the, really the thing that as um, leaders we need to do, or organizations we need to do, is capitalize on that. Identify ways to help that spread. Create those centers of excellence. Create the metrics that enable and empower those behaviors to be recognized. It does seem to me that more often than not, um, DevOps is driven bottom up rather than top down. And I think there's an aspect of embracing that we need to do. So, so those, are my, those are my thoughts on adoption. Um, thank you very much for paying attention. Um, I'll leave you one final thought.